Hi, I'm Claudia Ashray. This is my new friend, Mark Schoenwetter, and we are here to celebrate Hanukkah, spread a little light, and talk to Mark about his amazing journey. Hi, Mark. How are you? So far, I'm doing good. Are you scared of me? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you look very handsome today. Oh, my God. Keep you t can you talk on this subject all the time? Yes. Yeah, so tell me about your sweater. Where is it from? Five and ten. Stunning. Isn't it? It's stunning. Yeah. It's a really big honor for me to talk to you. I think um, it's such a huge privilege to be, come from a generation where we have survivors who we can talk to and learn from. And I think a lot of young people are feeling um, a little scared uh, about the state of the world right now for Jews. Obviously with social media, TikTok, anti-Semitism and just hate in general spreads a lot faster. But can you talk about when you were coming up, it obviously didn't happen like that. There was no TikTok. Um, tell me about what, what that was like, the, the start of, of the hate and how you knew things were getting bad. Well, I start getting the knowledge how things are getting bad when I was a little child and the Germans invaded Poland and conquered Poland and start eliminating the Jewish people so then I start seeing how bad it starts getting. And of course, during the Holocaust, for this whole period of time, then I got the knowledge how bad could it be. Mm -hmm. And when that was happening, obviously, you went through enormous tragedy. You were hidden by other families in Poland and your values and your traditions were put on hold. And now you're here in America and we're celebrating Hanukkah. And I'm curious if you have any memories of celebrating Hanukkah before the war and what those traditions were like. Well, honestly, I have to say that I do not have any memory oh. of any basically Jewish holiday before the war before the Holocaust when it started mm -hmm. because there was no time for me to learn because we had to escape and hide during this whole period of time. And how old were you when the war started? Six. Six. And can you talk a little bit about, you know, part of your story is other families in Poland taking you in. And I'm curious if you are in contact with those people and just in general, what, what that was like. Well, the few people that helped us during this period of time, in particular two families. One was the family of Piwat, and the other one was family of Jejits. And just quickly saying how they did help us. Mm -hmm. For example, Mr. Piwat helped us escape from our little village and he took us to ghetto because he felt that would be the safest place mm -hmm. to be. And he later came and took us out from the ghetto, told us how to escape, helped us to escape, and took us to a village, to a farmer that took us in and hide us for a not long time, but enough for a whole one winter that we survived. Mm -hmm. And the other family was the Jejit's family again. They were so good to us that in case we couldn't fight during the winter, any other place to hide somewhere, this was a place that we could come in and they would keep us for a week or two but unfortunately, they were afraid we had to go and look around someplace else. Mm -hmm. And in particular, my mom kept in touch with them as long as she was alive. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yes. And so when you say us, who were you with at that time? It, my younger sister. There were three of us hiding during this whole period of time. Mom, my little sister, and me. And your mom stayed in contact with the family? Yes. Long after. Yes. Have you been back to Poland? Do you find it too difficult? Well, I've been back to Poland several times after I left Poland. What was that like? It was, honestly, it was very nice. Huh. It was 
very excited to go because I want to take first, I want to take my kids mm -hmm. and show them where I came from. Then I want to take my grandkids where they were able to travel already. And they went to Poland with me. And then we went again once because they renew the cemetery in our little village. And then again, I went to Poland because they found the grave where my father was killed. Wow. And not only him, but there were another 250 People. men, women, and children that were killed. So I did go several times to Poland. How many grandchildren do you have? Well, I have four grandkids. One daughter has two girls and the other one has two boys that's amazing it's nice. what do you do on hanukkah with them well we i created this tradition when they were already a little older that we all have to make latkes potato pancakes yeah delicious they're delicious so good and i say my are the best <laughs> 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 what do you put on it? Applesauce? I don't. You don't? No. I like to eat them the way they are. Are you against applesauce in general or just when it comes to latkes? Oh, I like sauce, you know, applesauce, whatever. <laughs> but somehow this looks good. And through the tradition, when we used to be at, before I came to the United States, and we made Hanukkah when we, we're together with mom and this. We used to make the potato latkes and put them into chicken soup. Oh, that's nice. And it was so good. I'm sure. It sounds it stunning. It was so good. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of your grandkids, I think the statistic is around 70% of Gen Z, Generation Z, doesn't know about the 6 million Jews who perished in the Holocaust. And I'm curious what your take on that is. Well... My take on it is very simple. That we not educating the young generation to have the knowledge what happened in those times. Mm -hmm. We let them forget maybe. And the most important thing is that in particular the young generation should keep this in mind and be knowledgeable. So maybe, maybe will never happen this again. Yeah. And what's your, what do you want your main takeaway to be? Because, you know, it's a huge privilege for me to sit here with you and I've met survivors in the past and I recognize how much of a privilege that is and how that won't always be the case. And I'm curious if you have a takeaway you want to impart onto the younger generation when it comes to all that you've been through. Well, besides knowing what I went through with my mom and my sister and the ones who went through, regardless if this was in a concentration camp or hiding somewhere, that those people, the young generation, even if the older generation, is aware of what happened at this period of time. More knowledge they have there is more possibility that if God forbid anything like it, somebody will try to do it. Mm -hmm. They will have some opponents to it, some people knowledgeable right. to it, try to stop it. And I always say, I don't want us to be a war between one and the other. Mm -hmm. So if we teach the young generations that we don't want to live in hatred mm -hmm. and we don't want to create hatred between us. Then maybe we will avoid the hatred. Yeah. You know, you seem like a very happy guy. And when I walked in here, you had this big smile, your daughter's here. Um, how do you, what is like, how do you see the world? You know, I think you've seen more and been through more than most people ever will. And you still have this like wonderful radiance about you. How, how, how do you do that? Well, I give all this credit to my mom. 
and I tell you why. Because during this period of time that we were hiding, and you know, two little kids, hungry, mm -hmm. dirty, uh, everything, you know, horrible, everything, everything, whatever could be bad, it was. Mm -hmm. And every time when we hungry, we cried, mom always had an excuse with a smile, mm -hmm. with the hope giving us that will be better, don't worry. When we were hiding in the forest and it was raining, we were wet. Mm -hmm. We cried, it's cold. We wet. Mom was saying, listen, it's not so bad. You know, it's going to be sunny soon. Mm -hmm. You take your clothes, you hang them on a tree, they will dry out, and you see you have clothes and they're fine. Mm -hmm. Every little thing she had the positive outlook on it. Keep us always not crying, not right. complaining. Right. That's why I got this from her and I feel, look, I survived. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't I be happy? True. And so now that you're a parent, did you take that sort of energy that she had when it came to raising your own kids? Definitely. Yeah. Same thing. I try to make always my kids look forward with happiness mm -hmm. and be positive on things. Don't cry, don't fight between friends or this. Keep always friendship with everybody because that's the only way to live. We'll, to live. Yeah. And then when you were raising your kids, what kind of gift giver were you? Did you give them a lot of presents? One every day, one for all eight days. What did you do on Hanukkah? Well, <laughs> usually on Hanukkah, in my tradition, what little as I knew about the holidays, whatever I knew later, I used to always give him a few pennies. <laughs> Hanukkah guilt, as they say. Right. That was a gift, and this, I'm not a big gift giver. <laughs> Are you a big gift receiver? No, <laughs> no, honestly, no, no. What do you want for Hanukkah this year? You see, you got me here. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something you want? Mm, no. No. No, no. I accept as it is, make potato latkes, mm -hmm. be with the family, enjoy it, and that's the best thing. Nothing better than that. Nothing better. Keep going. I'd like a Chanel bag for Hanukkah. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel um, very privileged to have gone to Jewish day school and learn about the Holocaust. And even in middle school, have the opportunity to meet with survivors and have lunch with them and then eventually go to Poland when I was in the 12th grade. Um, it was a very difficult trip. I think in a lot of ways we were a little young, but also there's no... There's no perfect time to learn about what happened there. Um, and to be honest, some of my my most fond memories from growing up was the privilege of meeting survivors. And now that I do this for a living and I meet so many people who aren't Jewish or have never even met a Jew, I feel like the importance of you telling your story is tenfold. I'm sure you don't want to wake up every day and relive the tragedies, but I know you know how um, sadly not only are these stories dwindling, but so many people don't know about them. And it, it, and it makes me sad. I can't even imagine how um, upsetting that must be for you. It is upsetting that people don't know. That's why I always say that everybody should be educated about it and have knowledge about it. Because that's the only way, if we know what's going on, it will never maybe happen again. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things. And then, too bad when you went to Poland, we didn't know each other. I know, we could have synced up. This we will go. Yes. You see? And I, I do it, think um, it's uh, really popular right now. There are a lot of books that become very popular and trendy, whether it's 
historical fiction or true stories about the Holocaust. I think movies are a great, great way to learn. I watched, you know, all the movies growing up. And while I think it's, when I think back on how young I was watching it, I think I'm like, oh my God, why was I watching that movie? But I do think it ingrained in me like a really serious level of empathy and, and thirst for knowledge when it comes to um, learning about the Holocaust. And I think those movies are great for someone who didn't have the privilege like me of going to Jewish day school, going to Poland, learning, going to Yad Vashem. Um, and while those journeys are are difficult, I do think that they're really important, especially for young people. Because then when you look around and things are in disarray, and I think it feels for a lot of the Jewish community, like the anti-Semitism is just like more and more and more, and it doesn't stop. I think you realize how much more important it is to learn that. And I'm sure that's something that when you were raising kids and, and grandchildren, they were so honored to have you in their life to teach him about it and then also to share with their friends. So you were a popular guy. <laughs> well, nope. you were right. You were one thing <laughs> right here that I did devoted my time from the minute, the, I mean, say the minute. You needed some time. To tell him about the survival of mine because if they wouldn't know, how can I live without telling them that? Right. And, you know, speaking of Hanukkah, I'm curious if you have a similar story. So for me, when we were younger, I'm one of four girls, and we would light in order of um, oldest to youngest. So I wouldn't get to light until the third and then the seventh night. And it kind of stunk because, like, I was a little bored waiting for everyone. I'm like, hurry it up. I could do this better. Um <laughs> And so, but when I think back on that, like how lucky I am to have grown up with those sorts of traditions, and I don't think people would even realize it until everything is taken away from them, like it was when you were a kid, how important those traditions are. That's, I agree with you a thousand percent, not a hundred, because I say the traditions are the most important things. Mm -hmm. And then you see yeah. your grandkids and it must bring you so much joy. So much joy, yes. What do they call you? What's your name? Grandpa, Granny, Gramps? Poppy. Poppy. That's a good call one. Call me Poppy. That's nice. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Can you walk me through the journey of going from, you know, a young boy, the war has ended, you're living in Poland, to then the man you are now. You have a family, you have grandchildren, a business, you're a mogul um, in America. What was that journey like? How did, how did you get here? Well, when we lived in Poland... After the war, we lived in Poland till 1957. So we got some experience living under the communist regime. How was that? Well, depends. <laughs> <laughs> now you can, I can say it now. It was good and it was bad. Right. Good. Because we were fr had freedom, mm -hmm. we didn't have to hide anymore. Regardless, we didn't understand what communism is. Mm -hmm. So it was good because we live. It wasn't we, the Nazis. It was not the Nazis, exactly. But it was tough a little bit because you have to be careful what you said and what you did because... Maybe you wouldn't go to a concentration camp, no way. Right. But you could be punished for it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we left Poland because at one point the Polish government permit the Jewish people, if they be approved by the government, to leave Poland and the only one place they will let them go is to Israel. So my mom applied for the papers to leave Poland. They checked us, of course, and they approved us. And we went to Israel. And then it was a little difficult in those days in Israel because undeveloped the country was and it was hard to get a job and mm -hmm. so far. So I was talking to my mom and I would like to go to America. How old were you? I was time? at that time, early 20s. Already. Okay. So mom had a couple 
three sisters and a brother here, which came in 1920, 18. So anyway, we asked them, they sent papers for me, and I immigrated to United States by myself. Wow. I went by myself. I went on a boat, and I came to America. And of course, when I got here, it was difficult because I didn't speak one word of English. Oh, right. I didn't have any money. Mm-hmm. No, excuse me. Mom gave me $5 on it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my money here. <laughs> so, but I was staying with my aunt. But then she says, you have to get a job. Of course. I couldn't get a job because I didn't speak English. Mm-hmm. Nobody wanted to give me a job. But finally, there were this three, there was a father with two son and son-in-law. They had a factory. My cousin knew him and asked him they can give a job for a, someone that is also from Poland, and they were from Poland. So anyway, they interviewed me, they gave me a job. When I came in, I started working. I didn't know anything because when I came here, in Poland, I was a student in, the, in law school. I was at the university. Hmm. My sister was in the university and medical school. So when we came to Israel, she went to medical school, but I had to go to work to make a living. Mm-hmm. So when I came here, I didn't have a trade, nothing. Right. So when I came to work, what was my first job? They gave me a broom and a shovel, sweep the floors, Mm -hmm. keep the place clean. And that's how I started working there. And I learned slowly the trade. It happened to be a jewelry factory. So I started slowly working and I became, after five years, the manager in this place. And then I had the opportunity. The one guy was retiring that had a little factory. I knew him. I bought this place from him, and I went on my own. And I started my own business. And I was over 40 years in the business of manufacturing wedding rings and engagement rings. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. What do you think? No, I, I looked at her. Oh. <laughs> Do you walk into a room and survey everyone's jewelry now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, what do you think? Like, I have some crazy it's earrings. Gorgeous. Like, you like it? It's not too much? It's gorgeous. You want them? I, I looked at that, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. And so you came directly to New York from Israel? I came to New York and I went, they, my cousin, which I didn't know him, of he course. didn't know me. And I was scared because I got off the boat, I come to this big room, and I don't know what to do with myself, where mm-hmm. to go. I, I don't know even how to ask anybody. Right. But he was, but Ann was smart enough, ask, I sent a picture of myself. So I sent a picture, so then he comes to me, shows me a picture. I say, well, it's me. <laughs> How did you learn English? At, at work. At work. Got it. Yeah. So that's how I came to the United States. And, and how did you meet your wife? Oh, that's a tough one you're giving me here. That's a shame to say. <laughs> Just simply saying quick, a friend of mine I used to have, which came from Israel here too, a Polish guy too, we visited each other. He lived in Brook in Queens. Mm-hmm. I live in New Jersey. And it's when the, on Sundays, we visited each other. One time he came in and he liked the bread. He ate a piece of bread. He said, it's good bread here. So I said, let's go to bakery and buy a bread. <laughs> so we went to the bakery. We bought the bread in it. The girl who is taking the money the cashier is a young girl, and we start making jokes in Polish about the girl, you know, comments. Mm-hmm. In Polish, so how can she understand? 
Oh, no. So when we were walking out, she says, you know, don't take for granted that nobody else knows this language. Well, we didn't feel too comfortable after all the comments we were making. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning when I met her. And later on, I moved to, I looked for a house mm -hmm. to move from my little upstairs in a one family house. I lived on the attic there almost. So I got my little money already, so I looked for an apartment, and I got a room. And who is living in the same house? Her with her parents. Oh, my God, it's Bashir. It's a Bashir. Yes. Yeah. That's so nice. I love that. <laughs> and that's how it began. Perfect story. Fair <laughs> Great. Thank you. We killed a pound. Nice. Um, can we take some pictures? You have your celebrity smile on? Ha, <laughs>